we're on the floor early, so it gives me a little time to take my time to preach the word of the Lord today. Revelation chapter 21, I want to read there verses 1 through to 8 to start off this morning and preach on the subject, heaven for me. How about you? <laughs> Revelation 21 verses 1 through 8. Would you stand while we read the scripture this morning? This is John the Revelator, and uh, he tries in a measure with his human eyes, understanding, and vocabulary to describe the unscribable. <laughs> right? He said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But, he says, the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. If that scripture could just remain for a few minutes. The first seven, beauty that you can hardly describe and longing for. And then he gets this eighth verse. Eighth verse. So I want this as a foundation before I start this morning. Not everybody's going to make it to heaven. I'm going to make a few statements as I start out, and I, I hope you don't think that I'm sarcastic, okay? But anyway, just to say, not everybody's going to make it. But I want to make it. Do you want to make it? Amen. Heaven for me. Oh, Jesus, this morning, open the ears of our understanding and our eyes to see today, Lord, what you have prepared for them that love you. And, Lord, I want to confess this morning, I do love you. And, Lord, I hope that those among this congregation do too. Lord, we want to go to heaven. Be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Three part message this morning uh, means that we want to go to heaven. What does it take to ensure that we make that destiny? I want to talk about those who have made themselves ready and uh, then look at the Bible again and see what it says about heaven. What is it going to be like? We can know in a measure. So we're going to see and learn from the scriptures this morning and get a glimpse. And I say just a glimpse. There's no way to know and to understand and to see all that heaven is about. We're human. It's a different place. John tried his best to describe what it is. But this morning we're going to read a lot of scripture. And let the scripture speak to you directly. We've already mentioned the setting for the message that we awoke Thursday morning with revelation on our mind and what we'd be reading and anticipating that day, the song that came to my mind and the subject that I preach today. Now it seems in the last few years at least, or maybe I've just come to this in my ministry understanding now, and the older you get, the more funerals you attend. 
And it seems like that's about the only time you hear about heaven is at a funeral. And you know something? It's in the context of those, or comforting those who mourn. But there's so much more to heaven than just comforting those who mourn. And so this morning I'd like to look at it in a much different setting. Heaven, the hope of every Christian, and to tell us that we can anticipate better days ahead. I'm thankful that Jesus went to the cross to purchase my salvation, to rid my sins so that heaven could be possible for me. I'm spending a whole lifetime down here preparing for it. We sang the course this morning, I'm getting ready to leave this world. <laughs> I'm getting ready for the gates of pearl, keeping my garments white and watching both day and I'm getting ready to leave this world. What's ahead for us? If anybody knows anything about finances and you did a little bit of investing, you look for your money to bring back more than you actually put in. Well, I've uh, spent a lifetime thus far preparing and putting investments on the other side. And you know what? The returns are literally out of this world. Amen. I'm looking to go to heaven someday. The older that I'm getting and that you are getting, it seems like our own mortality becomes more and more real to us. Death all around, uh, nursing homes with dementia, disfigured bodies, and all the cases that are there. The hospitals with sickness and dreaded diseases and even some fatal diseases. The world that we're part of, men's hearts failing them for fear. Stress levels so high physically unfit, young men and women younger than myself dying. Accidents like happened just on Friday over in Astle claiming a 66-year-old 60 year man's life. Funeral homes and wakes, and we were at Juanita Carr's wake last night. There's one thing that's sure, life is uncertain and death is sure. Now, Considering that this morning, that life's so uncertain and death's sure, we need to prepare for our time of departure from this world. And just as the hairs of your head are all numbered, your days are also numbered. And so we need to spend each day wisely. I want to talk about destiny today. And each one of us that are here are going to spend eternity in one of two places. It's either going to be heaven or it's going to be hell. I mentioned to you that I've attended several funerals, even preached several myself. I've noticed something, and here's where I'm going to get a little facetious, okay? I've noticed something at funerals. Nobody goes to hell. All dead people go to heaven. Even the worst devil that walked in shoe leather, leather takes on saint status at death. Okay, now, Sunday school teacher once asked some young kids, said, uh, what do you have to do to go to heaven? And the young fellow piped up, he said, die. He had it right, didn't he? <laughs> All right. Now, folks, it's time that we face some facts. There's a lot of false hopes given at funerals. And it's no wonder there are so many people today opting out of funerals altogether because it's just ceremony, ritualistic things, and I tried to find a word that would describe this, and all I could come up with is plastic. Huh? When it's supposed to be a source of comfort and closure, when in reality false hopes are given and uh, people putting their trust in empty promises. If no one goes to hell, why is it even mentioned in the Bible? There was a rock group several years ago, and I don't know all the words to this song, and I'm glad I don't, but there's words that ring over my mind. That rock group said, we know there ain't no heaven, and we hope there ain't no hell. My land, how, how far off can you get from the scriptures? 
In Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41, let me read to you from the scripture. Hell was made for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41. And then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, who was hell prepared for? The devil and his angels. I guess that's why nobody goes to hell at death. The devil and his angels. This place. But I read something else in scripture. In Isaiah 5, 14, hell hath enlarged its borders. Oh my. What was the need for there to be an enlargement? Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and that he rejoiced that shall descend into it. The reason that hell hath enlarged her borders is to make room for more than the devil and his angels. Wow. I asked you a question this morning, and I don't know if you've ever thought of it. Who's going to preach your funeral? And will that man preach the truth or give you a false hope? Now, according to the Bible, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, let me read it to you. Straight is the way, and narrow is the road that leads to eternal life, and few there be that find it. There it is. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. Few there be that find it. Now the next verse is it there as well. But broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many that go in thereat. There's two words here if I interpret this portion of scripture right. And I look at the many and the few. It looks like to me the majority is not going to be saved and spend eternity in heaven with the Lord. That's another reason why hell hath enlarged her borders. Now, it was not the Lord's intentions that you go to hell. That's why he came and that's why he died to pay the price for sin and so that you wouldn't have to go. So this morning... I want to be among the minority that will be going to heaven and spending eternity with Jesus. But notice the scripture. Straight and narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. But for that few, oh my, the benefits and the rewards at the end of the road, literally out of this world, oh, heaven for me. Jesus will be what makes it heaven for me. So, what does it take to ensure that you and I can make that destiny called heaven more than just dying? Now, have I got anybody's attention this morning? Anybody still want to go? <laughs> yeah, I think more want to go right now than when we started because you've just learned not everybody's going. But I want to go. <laughs> Do you want to go? Well, let's look at it. We need to obey the gospel plan of salvation. That's the necessity if you're going to go to heaven. Well, what is the gospel anyway? Let me read it to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Paul, preaching here to the church of Corinth, he said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye also have received, and wherein ye stand. And which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you've believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. There's the gospel. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you're going to go to heaven, you need to identify with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. How do we do that? His death, we repent of our sins. His burial, we are baptized in his name for the remission of our sins. His resurrection, we receive Christ's spirit, the Holy Ghost. Evans to speak in other tongues as the spirit of God gives utterance. 
Now, uh, let me read it to you in another portion of Scripture in Acts chapter 2 and 38. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There's your salvation experience appropriated personally. Now, that's just your beginning. After this begins a sanctified, separated, holy walk of faithfulness, being loyal to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ until death or until the rapture of the church. Faithful saints of God. Now that, my friend, will guarantee you a destiny in heaven with Jesus for eternity. Wow. Now, straight is the way, or straight is the gate, narrow is the way, and according to the Bible, there's only one way. Acts 4 and verse 12. Why did I stress that this morning? There's only one way. I'm getting to it in a, little, in a few moments. There's several out there that will tell you there's, uh, there's many roads that lead to Rome. Well, yeah, there might be, but I'm not talking about Rome. <laughs> I'm talking about heaven. And according to the scripture, there's only one road to heaven. Okay, and straight and narrow is that way. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Galatians 1, verse 8 and 9. Though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than what we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. That's the Apostle Paul talking to the church at Galatia. Same one that wrote Corinthians and wrote about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's only one way to heaven. So, yeah, there's those that will promote their many other ways, but no, I don't see that in the Scripture. Now, unto those that have made themselves ready, the songwriter put it this way, Oh, what glory awaits me in heaven's bright city, and when I get there, such sights I'll behold. A million scenes and a rare beauty will demand that I view them, but Jesus will outshine them all. Amen. I'm looking to see Jesus more than all the streets of gold and walls of jasper and rivers clear as crystal. We won't notice any of that if Jesus isn't there. So today I want to share more with you from the Bible about heaven and our eternal reward. Now it's impossible to know everything about heaven and what it's going to be like, but we can have a general idea as given to us in the scripture. And when I say general, it's the sense that heaven is far beyond human comprehension far beyond human words that can be explained in vocabulary but there are some there that was given to us by John the Revelator so that we may in a sense understand what it's like. So what will it be like? Let me start in a different portion of scripture than Revelation. Let me look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that we shall be, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That leads me to a question. What's it like to be like Jesus? Wow. What's it like to be like Jesus? I've got some few things here I want to say, at least eight things, okay? Number one, what's it like to be like Jesus? No more sin. Jesus had no sin, did he? Now, in the body that you presently possess, <laughs> you don't know what it's like and you can't get away from it. It's flesh and it's prone to sin. But when I get to go to heaven, I'm not going in this body. I'm going to be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. <laughs> this body is going to put on immortality, okay? This corruptible incorruption. And the new body that I take on, no more sin. I need to be like Jesus, okay? In Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, he tells us here, this is Paul that wrote this as well. He said, he who has begun a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus. In other words, while we're still on this earth, we're still striving for perfection, for completeness, and one day we will get there. Not there yet, okay? But in heaven, there's no more sinful nature. We'll have been perfected, completed, and have a sinless nature. Now, uh, to help you understand that just a little bit better, and I know everybody here won't understand this because not everybody has a computer, I have to stand here every once in a while 
and make confession for the computer. <laughs> it makes a lot of mistakes. <laughs> no, it's usually the one that's hitting the keys that makes the mistakes, okay? <laughs> but every so often, that computer decides it's going to have a mind of its own. <clears throat> and it's going to do what it wants, and it'll crash or anything else. You get so frustrated with there's blug, bugs and glitches in the hardware and the software and all that. Can you imagine... And it's so much part of our life now. But can you imagine sitting down to a computer that worked perfect every time? <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's not even possible in this life, is it? And I hope there's no computers in heaven. All right, but a brand new body <laughs> that's sinless <laughs> and, and perfected. No more struggles with this flesh and sinful nature. That's what heaven's going to be like. In heaven, we're not going to be subject to the laws of physics. In John chapter 20 and verse 26, this was Jesus after his resurrection and before his ascension. There were 40 days in between there. And notice what it says here. Eight days, or after eight days, again, his disciples were within and Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, notice the next phrase, the doors being shut. And stood in the midst and said, peace unto you. Wow. Now, can you imagine that? Zoom, and he's there. You didn't hear any door open or slam. <laughs> and say, now, that's not possible with this physical body, is it? But it seems like the new body that we take on and be able to go through walls and doors and not even have to open or close. I, I can't even imagine that. Right? Because it's beyond human comprehension. But we find Jesus after his resurrection and before his ascension. He was able to go through walls and lock doors to be with his disciples. He appeared and disappeared at will. Travel was instant. I'm only trying to explain something in a measure. Can you really grasp that? Man, travel will be instant. We still get to eat and to touch the time between Jesus' resurrection and his ascension in Luke chapter 24, verse 39 through 43. And he was telling us, he said, Behold my hands and my feet, it's I myself, handle me and see. A spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. When he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they, while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye any meat? In other words, I'll, I'll, I'm hungry, I'll eat too, okay? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and then honeycomb, and he ate it in their presence, all right? There's another example where Jesus was eating with his disciples in John chapter 21 and verse 12, and he told them to come and have some breakfast, all right? Jesus said to them, come and dine. None of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou? knowing it was the Lord. Jesus cometh, taketh bread, and giveth them, and fish likewise. This was the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was risen from the dead. Man, what's it like, you know, to be in a body after the resurrection? He wasn't subject to the limitations that you and I are, nor even to the law of physics. Paul also told us something in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50, telling us that flesh and blood, that's your flesh and mine, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This body has got to change. Right, Revelation 22 and verse 2, and tells us that in heaven there's going to be a tree of life there bearing 12 manner of fruit and a different kind each month. Oh, what kind of feast is that going to be like? And even when we first get to heaven, we're going to be able to sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Can you imagine Pentecostals eating again? <laughs> You've heard the expression, no, we don't smoke, drink, eat, swear, nor cuss, and chew, but we like to eat. <laughs> So we sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We see these things that Jesus did after his resurrection. Can you imagine never being sick again? Wow. 
Now, Jesus will be what's going to make it heaven for me to be not sick anymore. is going to be heaven for somebody else. Right? If you know a lot of sickness down here, you can't wait for it to get out of that old body of yours. We currently live in a fallen, imperfect world, and people get sick, and they suffer, and they even die. But in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 3, it says that in heaven there will be no more curse. What do we mean no more curse? Revelation 21 and verse 4 explains it a little bit further. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. Oh my. What heaven is going to be like. Heaven. Amen. A world where in Isaiah chapter 35 verse 5 and 6 it tells us a little bit more. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. Wow. (laughs) No blindness in heaven. And the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Everybody be able to hear. What brand new body. One that's perfected and not subject to the limitations of this life. And uh, speaking of some things there, what about animals? People wondered, are any animals going to be there? Well, yeah, pet, pet lover's paradise. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6, going to be some animals there. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Wow. And verse 7, the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Revelation 19, 11. I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. <laughs> Talk about animals, boys, there's going to be a lot of them there, huh? And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and righteousness, he doth judge and make war. So it sounds like there's going to be a lot of animals there, more than just domesticated ones, but when you get there, they'll all be domesticated. You won't even have to worry about a bear eating your leg. Did you read the news this week? (laughs) New Brunswick man out in British Columbia attacked by a grizzly, ate his leg. All right, now, uh, will we know one another? Oh, yes, we will. In Matthew chapter 17, And verse 1, let me read to you the account of the transfiguration. Not heaven just yet, but we'll get to that. After six days, Jesus taketh Peter and James and John, his brethren, and bringeth them into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with them, Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. What was happening here at Mount Transfiguration? You get the disciples recognizing and talking with people that lived hundreds of years before them. Moses and Elias. And they recognize it's going to be like that in heaven as well. All right, in 1 Corinthians... Chapter 13 and verse 12, Paul tells us here, presently we see through a glass darkly. If you don't know what that is, I'll give you my glasses. All right, it tries to make my vision a little clearer. All right, see through glass darkly. But then we'll see face to face. We shall know in part, then shall I know even as also I am known. Oh, what heaven is going to be like. Yes, we will recognize one another, even though that we have different bodies than the one that we presently possess. Amen. All right. In heaven, love, joy, and peace. We're going to experience these things in a way that we've never experienced them here. Presently, it's hard for us to know uh, uh, 100% or 100% joy, love, and peace. It's only in part that we know these because we're living in imperfect bodies and with imperfect people, but then we're going to know that in its fullness and in its perfection. Heaven, all of the earthly element and flesh is going to be removed so that we'll know love in its truest measure. We're going to rejoice and be at peace. Oh my, what heaven must going to be like. 
Scripture talks about we're going to live in the New Jerusalem. In Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 3, brand new home. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth were passed away. There was no more sea. I, John, saw the holy city in New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle or dwelling place of God is with men, and he shall dwell with them. They shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. This city, New Jerusalem, that John saw, and Jerusalem being known as the city of peace, it was massive. We could read down a little farther and find out that it's 12,000 furlongs long, wide, and high. That's a perfect cube. Now, I don't understand furlongs, neither do you, so let's put it into a conversion table. Do you understand miles? I can't imagine a place 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, and 1,500 miles high, but if you want to put it in perspective, that's about the size of the moon. All right. It says that in this city, 12 gates with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel written on them, 12 foundations, 12 layers, the names of the apostles in Revelation chapter 21, verse 12 through 17. I am also read that. We've got the time here this morning. And we're trying to uh, describe to you what heaven is going to be like. Hopefully by the time we're done here, you'd say, man, I want to go. And then in the next verse, you're going to say, but I don't want to die. <laughs> All right. Had a great wall high and had 12 gates. And at the gates, 12 angels, the names written thereon and the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. On the east, three gates, the north, three gates, the south, three gates, and the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the walls thereof. And that city lieth four square, the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. He measured the wall thereof, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. Uh, is there any? Yeah, that's verse 17 and verse 18. And the building of the wall of it was jasper. The city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. Wow. <laughs> can you imagine, or can you picture that in your mind just briefly what it's like? I don't know what jasper looks like. <laughs> when it mentions uh, pure gold, I know what 14 karat gold is. But I don't know what pure gold is clear as crystal I can't even imagine that all right uh, and the foundations with precious stones in it we could read further on through to verse 21 would you skip that for now but God dwells in this city and the light of his glory is going to shine through all these precious stones and whatnot and make some brilliant colors brighter than the rainbow can you imagine that as the songwriter says oh what Beauty awaits me in heaven's bright city, and when I get there, such sights I'm going to behold. A million scenes of rare beauty. But Jesus is going to outshine them all. Amen. To be in heaven is to be with Jesus. Now that's important, isn't it? More important than anything else is the fact that we will be with Jesus forever. I sang the course this morning. Jesus will be what makes it heaven for me. From his throne flows a river of life, and the river flows perfect, clear as crystal. We're going to see him face to face according to Revelation chapter 22 and 4. They shall see his face, and his name shall be upon their foreheads. Verse 5, there's not going to be any night there. No need for a candle, neither light of the sun, for God or the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Wow. Amen. There's something about heaven. And uh, we're going to be able to not only be with Jesus, but to talk with him. Can you imagine the voice of Jesus? It describes it here in Revelation 14 and 2 that his voice was like the voice of many waters. 
and even of great thunder. I heard the voice of harpers and the harping with their harps, but Jesus' voice, sound of many waters and like thunder. Imagine in heaven the story she's going to tell, the lessons we'll learn and the love that we will share. Amen. Notice what John, not the revelator now, but John uh, that wrote uh, the book of John. And what he tells us in John 14, starting at verse number 1 through 6, and you've heard this many times, he describes it too. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, and I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? But Jesus said unto him, that's Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. Sometimes a scripture that we quote is good if you can put this one into memory. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9. I hath not, as it is written, I had not seen nor ear heard, neither have it entered into the heart of men the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. Oh my. Now Jesus said he would do everything possible for us to make sure that we could go to heaven. And he tells us we should also do everything we need to do so that we can go there. The first was be obedient to the gospel. Notice some other things. Uh, what happens after the death, burial, and resurrection? What happens after repentance, baptism in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost? That's when your life of separation, sanctification, and holiness begins. Notice what he says further in Matthew chapter 5, verse 29. If your right eye would offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not thy whole body perish and be cast into hell. Verse 30, if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, cast it from thee. For it is, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not the whole body should be cast into hell. In other words, don't let... One of your members be the offense and keep you out of your eternity or destiny with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do everything in your part and power to make it. And with what Jesus did and what you do, then you can spend eternity together. Oh, heaven for me. Amen. In closing this morning, I would like for you to think about eternity for a minute. We started out by telling you, you're going to spend eternity in one of two destinations. It's either heaven or hell. And I would just as soon it be heaven for everybody that's here this morning. We need to be among the few and uh, be with Jesus forever. Oh, the choice is yours this morning. You get to choose. And it's more than just a mental asset. You say, I want to go to heaven. That means you're going to have to repent of your sins. That means you're going to have to be baptized in Jesus' name. That means you're going to have to be filled with his spirit. And that means you're going to have to live a holy, separated, sanctified life until he either comes to get you or until you die. Wow, heaven for me. What about for you? Praise God. Sister, would you come back to the piano this morning? I hope that you're not disappointed with the message this morning. What I did to you was read the scripture in the Bible, and I'm almost left with, hey, I said I was going to try to describe it. I can't. <laughs> right? It's beyond me. It's going to be something far greater. And that's why maybe we might be disappointed. Oh, we thought you could. Describe. No, I can't. <laughs> Just far greater than anything in this life. But I do want to go there. Amen. Would you stand this morning? When we are